they were like, can you stop smiling? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stop smiling. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Welcome, welcome, fear not. I have to say, series one of When I Was 25 is well and truly over. It's, it's ended, but we are back. Series two. My name is Vinnie Hurl and this is the programme about life in your 20s. We'll focus on that decade. We deviate a little bit to give you some context, but the decisions we made, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, and how they shaped and influenced our lives. Series 1 had people uh, like Claire Richards from Steps, Anton de Beck from Strictly, and Heather Mills. And here are some of the voices you can get right now in Series 2. Surely you don't expect me to talk to you about that. People who lose a parent young are always damaged in some way. There's always going to be a bigger, badder bitch around the corner. You know, I was so close to death. From Seema Katacha to Arlene Phillips, I couldn't tell you if I had a favourite. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, maybe you don't care. But there you go. From Seema to Arlene and everything and everyone in between. And what makes these chats special, I believe, is that we're talking to them in their home. So I'm in a studio called Horrible BBC Studio, just kind of, and they are in their houses, their penthouse suites, their, their apartments, they're in their bedrooms, sat in the bed, they're in their kitchen at the table, having a chat with me. In this episode, we have the wonderful, the fierce, the talented, multi-talented, original sugar babe, it's Mucha Buena. How are you? You look fantastic. I can't lie, within the last month or so, I've been like on a strict, strict diet. Um, I slightly feel like I should have done this like many, many, many years ago. <laughs> um, but I literally, I, I dream of green juices. Like I literally wake up every day at like 4.30, 5 o'clock guaranteed. And then I start making fresh juices. And it has to be green. So it'd be like kale, spinach, cucumber. <laughs> You know, it's not the rock and roll lifestyle I thought you were going to, you know, give us no. an, an insight into there, no? It's taken me a while to get to the comfortability of how I feel right now. Like, mentally, I feel so... I feel this is the best I've felt in many, many years. And it's taken me a freaking long time to get there. I think as we were getting older, and I just think, I think to myself, OK, if I don't do this now, is this ever going to happen? So I, I've been doing it for the last couple of months. And then, obviously you know, doing the festivals with the girls. I'm like, okay, I've got to be like, game one. <laughs> it must be yeah. quite physically singing, dancing, moving, the energy. To be honest, I think that's the one thing we want to make sure, like, for all of us, because me and Keisha's been doing, like, our walks. Like, we walked from, like, Camden all the way to, like, West Finchley the other day, and we just walked and walked and walked. And, and that was the influence of Keisha. But... I feel like it's just so nice to be able to kind of do work and just feel fresh minded and, and have the energy people want, you know, like no one wants to see old hags on the stage. <laughs> I, you, know? you can say that. I can't say that. I, uh, look, well, what, what we do in this, this program is we, we kind of take people back to their, their 20s. For most of us, it's quite a formidable part of our lives. It shapes a lot of our future lives. Of so course. We'll kind of go to your mid 20s, first of all, around the age of 25. What was happening in your life there? Where were you? My God, I think at the age of 25, I'd already gone solo, or I was on the process of going, going by myself. Um, to be honest, it's just been such a crazy, crazy time. Like, I feel, I feel like I hadn't appreciated and kind of lived the moment of being so young. And I think that's the problem that we were all very young. Um, I was the youngest, obviously, and, and I felt like I just didn't appreciate enough. And that's why I think this time around, it makes me feel like, you know what, I want to put my whole 100 in. But when we step out and we sing together, I thought that I get, I get so emotional. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, it's beautiful. And I think it's, I think it's for us, it's the right time for us to go out and give people everything that, you know, they wanted. But in my 20s, I guess my life was all over the place. I was enjoying life a little too much sometimes and the difference now I feel like it's you know we're having fun but concentrating on what makes us happy yeah and to give some context for people a lot of people will know you of course from the sugar babes you were really really young when that started yeah. so what were you, were you 13 14 I was 13 14 so I when I when I joined 
we got signed and released Overload when I was 14. That's crazy. Like, when you think back now, you're a mum yourself. I am. But when you think back, like, 14 is so, so young. Very, very. That's why I feel like I never appreciated anything as much as I do now. Purely because all I wanted to be at was with my friends. You know, we were invited to all the parties and, and we had such great times. But, you know, when you're so young, you just, you know, you don't really appreciate as much. It's just how it is. But I'm also thinking of the pressure that's on people in that industry, regardless of what age yeah. you are. And the expectations, especially on women, there's a lot of pressure and expectation, sexism, whatever you want to call it. Lots yeah. of different issues. So if you're 25, if you're 40, that's a lot to deal with. Yeah. If you're 14, what's that like? It was very pressure. It was very pressuring, to be honest, because we all were trying to be the best that we could at the same time, you know, and also there was like 101 million voices talking to you, telling you what to do, you know, where to be and what time to be there. And it really did take a toll on a lot of our lives. Um, obviously, in an appreciated way, you know, we was able to fulfill our, our dreams and be able to do that. But... I do feel as young kids, like if my daughter was to say to me, and she's 17 now, so like if she told me she wanted to do music at the age of thing, I would have been like, girl, hold, hold on, <laughs> slow down, you know, and there would have been like, you know, there's plenty of time out there for you to go get your dreams. But I think there was a lot because we were young and there was a lot of grown ups around us that were most probably a lot of influencers in different ways. So it was very confusing, but um, we got through it and we're well, still here to, to sing <laughs> would you let your daughter I can't believe you have a 17 year old daughter it just goes to show how fast time is going but would you let her go into that industry now if she said mom I really really want to do it that it would have to be something it would have to be that she I could see in her face and her eyes and her heart and soul would so into it otherwise no otherwise no no definitely not I feel like um, the industry isn't for the light hearted and I feel like, you know, if you don't have the right people around you, you could get swallowed. For me, mental health for, in the music industry itself is such a big thing. And I don't think people realise how mental health in the industry, as in, the, you know, we all look at someone and goes, oh, my God, they must be living the best life. Like, they're so happy and so lucky. And what you don't realise is that we're the most probably loneliest people. That I spend most of my time at home by myself. My daughter goes out more than I do. And I, I, I can spend Monday to Sunday in the house. If I'm not working, I literally have, won't see the daylight. And I just stay indoors. Why is and that? I just, it's not that I'm trying to stay away from people, but I, I've become quite detached to the social life. And um, I feel like I've done so much in, in the industry of all my, my whole life, from my teens to my 20s, now I'm in my 30s. Um, there's nothing I ain't seen and nothing I ain't did. Like, I've had my fun and... And I'm having fun now, but I'm having fun in the clean way, in the cleanest way, you know, mindset's amazing. Back in the days, I wanted to look for the closest, you know, the the, the closest party that was going on and who was out till five in the morning. And So at 14, when you're doing that, it, was that what you really wanted to do or was it the other influences that were kind of pushing no. you along? God, no, no. By the age of nine, I already toured the whole of Europe. I literally toured the whole of Europe singing and doing Filipino dancing and Hawaiian so wow. I was actually dancing before I sang. I don't know if it's interesting, but yeah, I, I used to I used to dance a lot more. So I did Hawaiian dancing and Filipino folk dancing, and um and I sang like with a Filipino group. So I actually travelled the whole of Europe by the age of nine, ten, and then I met my manager at the age of eleven. Performing has always been uh, a thing for me. My mum and dad used to put me in like Little Miss Philippines, the beauty contest, <laughs> the beauty contest and all sorts. So I've kind of grown up, I've grown up on the stage. My dad plays the guitar amazingly. So I used to sit there, my dad would play, strum the guitar and I'd sing with him. Um, my mum's amazing at singing as well. So I've always had music going on, but I just didn't realise it was going to work out so early. Yeah. Um, our, our previous manager, he also found, you know, the likes of like All Saints and Gabrielle and everyone. So he had already made his name out there. So when I had met him at 11 years old, it seems really weird. <laughs> but he was like, yeah, my God, I'd love to sign her to my dad. My dad was like, yeah, OK. OK, let's just, you know, let's try and see how this works out first. We're all very new to the whole studio life. Um, so, yeah, it kind of worked out and it worked out for the rest. It did.
for a lot of us, we we work towards our twenties, maybe our thirties, and, and I think people assume your life peaks in some ways, maybe career wise, in your thirties. But when you mm-hmm. hit peaks like getting into the top ten, when you're you're just about a teenager, like so, freak like freak like me, was that your first number one? Number one, yes. And that was two thousand and two. So, what age would yeah. you have been then? Oh my god. Um... So I would have been about maybe 17, 18. It, it baffles me because I, I, I can't get my head around if that happened to me, it, it won't because I can't okay. sing now. But I yeah. was so immature at 17 and so naive. I, I don't think I could have handled that. It was a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. I find I don't do, I mean... Now I'm a bit more relaxed on it, but I think back in the day, everyone used to to always look at me like I'm some hard nut, you know, like, I don't know why, maybe it was like kind of the, maybe it's because of the area I grew up in and I was very, I was very, my, I I still acted my age, but I had to grow up quicker than my age. Um, But I think a lot of people used to always look at me in a very weird way. I'm still trying to put my finger on it. What do you mean in a weird way? Are they they wary of you? I I don't I got a lot of stick from the press. I got a lot of stick from people. You know, even when I used to go out clubbing at a young age, I used to have people that wanted to fight me in toilets. It was ridiculous. I had it a lot. Um, but back then I was so like, I don't care. I don't care. No, no, no. But because they tried to, a lot of people tried to always try and pick on me, um, especially when we was out. It was very bizarre. And I used to always have to pull people up and be like, I'm only 16, I'm only 17. Like, what the hell? So like, I, I really? thought you had jumped to your 20s there. So this is still in your, your kind of mid-teens. This is in my teens, yeah. The bullying that I got was more out of the group. It was more like um, me going out to a club and, you know, I had one time I had like 20 girls surrounding me, like really bullying me um, and telling me I was a bully and, you know, this and that. And I just thought, oh, are we here again? And I, 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 had, it, I had it the day before that. And I just remember it like it was, it sticks in my mind because, it happened a lot. Yeah. And and I used to always think, to, I used to always have to, I always had to try and justify myself and be like, no, I'm only 17 or I'm only 18. I've only just turned eight or I'm 16. And it's like people just never got it. So I found for me personally, it was just more harder for people to kind of, I don't know. They I don't know whether it was a relating thing or whether they just thought I was just too mouthy or I don't know. <laughs> Is it because over the years, girl bands, people like to give people in girl bands a persona, whether that's actually but, the, them or not. So maybe you were, you know, this the fierce one. I'll take it as a compliment all the way. Like, definitely. Yeah. I was so young. Yeah. It was age. Because my daughter, like, I'm always standing there going, oh, my God, can you just say you're embarrassing me? Stop it. And she's like, oh, what am I doing? And she's giving me looks. And I'm like, you're giving me a look. And I'm noticing these things, but she's not. So I'm taking it in, like, it's just age. Like, that's what happens. Can I ask, does your daughter think that it's cool that her mum's a pop star? Uh, I don't know if she calls me cool. <laughs> I'd like to say she said, so, to be honest, she came with us to Mighty Hoopla and she was so proud. She hasn't seen me perform in front of thousands of people like that in a very, 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 very long time. Now she's grown. And she was, she was like, I just can't believe this is you. Like, this is what you do. And I know she's proud. And, and, it's, and it's nice because I've now had the second, you know, a big opportunity to kind of come back again and show people, for all three of us, show people what our worth is and show people, you know, yeah, you've gone through many years without us, but we're here yeah. and we love to entertain people and we love singing live and we love we love our music, you know. And, and, and as much as Siobhan hasn't sang on most, on most of them songs that we sing, you know, the push the buttons and the holding heads, Siobhan does her part very well. It's, it's just something that we feel like we we just enjoy the performing part of it all, I think. And Tylee is, you know, I, I bring her to as much things as possible so she can kind of see what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's an incredible experience for her as well, I'm yeah. sure. And she must, yeah. must be proud, although kids at 17 aren't really meant to tell her their mums and their dads that they're proud but no. I'm sure she secretly is <laughs> um, so we've talked about your kind of early days um, and, and the start of Sugar Babes you you left the band you already had had number ones and then left the band by the time you were I was about 24, 25 when I'd left why, why did you leave and how did that feel leaving something that you clearly loved so much if I can be deadly honest I don't think I even thought about 
what I was doing then. Like in my head, I was just, I wanted to, you know, spend time with my daughter. Um, bearing in mind, push the button when we did the video. So I gave birth and then two weeks later, I'm already doing push the button video. I was so sick. Like I literally had gone from like eight and a half stone to six and a half stone because I had kidney infection. So I was so sick. And then and then we traveled straight away to New York to do Ugly, which Ty Leah was in the video. We were also, we were, I was saying to Keisha the other day, it was weird that because when we were doing that, that album, I was literally breastfeeding until 5 a.m. in the morning, uh, like every day continuously in the studio. And I had no time with her. And then, you know, while I was in the studio, the girls would have to hold her if she was crying. And it was a lot for me at that age because I just felt, I never felt alone, but I always felt like I just couldn't put my potential as a mother. And at the same time, I felt like if I had a little bit of time, I think I would have been fine. But I felt very pushed. I felt very like out there, was doing this, doing that. And um, I lost my mind and just needed a break. What do you mean you lost your mind? I just wanted a break. Yeah. I think all of us were working so hard. And I remember it like yesterday because there was like little things that, that was happening around us. And I just remember just feeling, you know, really, really low. And self-esteem was very was very zero as in like you know I didn't feel sexy didn't feel my normal self I just had a child no woman feels themselves after having a kid you know do you know what I mean it, it takes a while for you to pull yourself back together I didn't have that I didn't have the time off like I literally went straight back into work and is it difficult then to feel like you're having to pick between and I'm not comparing being a mother or your child to your career but the career with some it's so special it's so personal to you yeah to pick between that and then this little being that you've created, this baby that's so reliant yeah. on you. It seems like a tough I mean, decision. So it was very tough because my career is my, career's my baby. You know, we were in the studio recording One Touch album, leaving there at five, six in the morning, getting dressed in our school uniforms and being dropped straight to school. You know, it was it was like that. So me and Keisha would be like 7 a.m. putting on our clothes and in the car. And it was intense, like, we did a lot. Like, that's why when people talk about us, I was going, oh my God, you just have no idea. We have done. We've sacrificed. All three of us have sacrificed, um, including when Heidi was in the group. She, you know, she sacrificed by leaving her hometown. We all sacrificed so much individually. Do you regret any of those sacrifices that you made? Definitely not. My whole thing is, you know what? The sacrifices, we needed to do that to be where we are now. And it's worked off. It's it's fully worked off. Like I would never complain about our position in life and where we are and how, you know, people have grown to us and and you know, especially our fans, they have been such dedicated fans. Like ten years, nine years down the line, we haven't done a, you know, a show. We did Mike Hoopla, and we still have such a strong fan base. And that's not even within doing anything within the last couple of years. Like you have to, you've got to sacrifice things to make things work out. And that's why the blessing is, is that my daughter is 17 and there's nothing holding me back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did read that you, you'd suffered with postnatal depression after you, you had your baby. Like that is something, mm-hmm. I, I think in some ways we're getting a little bit better that we, we do talk about these things. The stigma is not oh God, yeah. what it was. What is that like when you're in that? Do you realise what's happening? No, I didn't realise for two years. So for, for about two years, I had no idea that I was even suffering with depression because in my head, I just noticed because I was really emotional. But then I thought, oh, you just had a baby, everyone gets emotional. But then it's like it was more deeper thoughts. It was, it was, it was, it was just deeper. And um, and I think with that and juggling and not having the time to be a mum and not having the time to also remember singing is my passion, it's it's my love, it's my life. So juggling what I love and what I love. If there was an in-between of a great time, you know, like, oh, we're going to send her off to the Caribbean for like two weeks, give her time off. Well, you know, somewhere I would have, I would have been, I would have been stuck in there. Yeah. Um, But suffering with depression was, was the hardest because you have to then own up to what you're going through. Um, For ages, I was like, oh. Like it's embarrassing. You don't tell people you're you're depressed or postnatal depression because people look at you completely different. Human beings back then were not human beings. You know, everyone couldn't speak. Like you said, you couldn't talk about anything because talking about it made you look crazy. 
And I guess then it, it's it's a form of shame then. And when you add that form of yeah. of of shame from society mm-hmm. or whatever onto how you you feel, like how 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 difficult did it get? It got difficult. It got difficult where I just I just you know sometimes I just sit in the dark and have my curtains closed all day long. It didn't matter whether it was hot, cold, whatever. I'd have the curtains closed, and and I felt that way for many many years. Um, to pull yourself out of such a dark place, um, we all say, well, yeah, you've got to have amazing people around you, but it isn't just that. You have to be so strong to want to pull yourself out of there because it's easy to have the curtains closed and, and you know, stare at a TV and not know what the hell you're thinking and what you're doing. You've got to pull yourself out of where you're absolutely, you know, you're, you're, you're basically messed. What was the turning point then? What brought you out of that or started that change? Uh, when I realized that I needed to do better for my daughter and when I realized I need to do better for myself, um, it, t- it took me a very long time. Like every so often, even now, I feel my, you know, we all go into like our little holes and, and feel very closed off and stuff. Even now, like I still have that feeling of not being the best of what I can be or, or feeling really like I'm not good enough or you know, and I still feel the feeling that I had many, many years ago, but I've learned how to pull myself out and be like, okay, you know what, give yourself a day, like, I, like you know, yet, for example, yesterday. And I just felt to myself, I said, you know what, I'm going to give yourself give yourself a day to, to feel the way that you feel, and then tomorrow you get the hell out of it and you get back on it and you jump on the horse and you keep moving. And that's what I did. I woke up this morning with a bounce in my step and I was like, that is it. I'm I'm doing something today, and I did. I went and met my mum, my sister, my auntie, and my cousins, newborn baby, and I'm back at home now talking to you. So, to me, it I think as human beings, we have to allow ourselves to have a day where we can be, you know, we're allowed to feel, we're allowed to feel like, you know, the world's on top of us, and you have to just give yourself time. We're talking in and around your your, your mid twenties now, uh, yeah. and you went solo. Yes, and you worked in your solo career. How scary is that? Or maybe it's not scary when you go from a, the band environment where there are other people there to it's just you. You're on your own on that stage. Very scary. Very scary. It took me a very long time to like be like that. I had to have two. I had to have two backing singers to make me feel like I was on stage with the girls. <laughs> Like, it was scary. Um, now, because I've never stopped, I've never stopped singing. Like, I always get shows. So now, when I go on the stage by myself without the girls, I own it. I own it. I do what I go do. I'm on it. Do what I'm doing. But back in the day, it was so scary. Like, I felt I felt alone on the stage. And that was, just, it was yeah. Because I'm obviously used to having the other two. Yeah. There's a pressure, we already have kind of mentioned it, there's a pressure on a pop star, how you look, um, how you perform, but also yeah. how your music does. So if you're getting number ones or if you're doing your own stuff then. So how do yeah. you how do you manage that pressure, that expectation from on yourself and from the record label for your music to do well? Um, to be honest, even now I thought to myself that I, I still can't believe Real Girl was 13 weeks behind Umbrella. You know, I always kept going, if Rihanna didn't release Umbrella, I would have been number one. It's all Rihanna's number fault. One. <laughs> but that's an achievement for your first single. And then working with Amy Winehouse, doing B-Boy, you know, God bless her soul. Like, I loved her to bits. I was a good friend of hers. We were good friends. And, and she was an amazing talent. Definitely a Rose of England. And then George Michael, another, another Rose of England. Like, I was so blessed to work with these amazing people who are no longer with us I got to work with them like who can actually say they work with Amy Winehouse and George Michael on the same album nobody so (laughs) (laughs) saying that saying that I feel so blessed when I was getting opportunity to work with all these people it didn't actually hit me until I was actually finally either recording it or it released and then I thought oh god okay 
Oh, and then I was offered to go on tour to a few tour dates with George Michael, and I was like, this is crazy. When you step out on stage, um, well, let's go back to Sugar Babes time. So when you go to a yeah. big gig and you perform in front of thousands of people, yeah. I, I've said this before in, in different interviews with people, but when I am in the audience and the energy from the crowd, because they're there <laughs> to see you, you know, it's not just random. They want to see you perform. And I know how I feel is that euphoria. So how does that feel for you as a young as a teenager stepping out onto that stage and people are singing your own songs back to you. Scary because a lot of the times that everyone was all older than us. We, you know, we would perform and the crowd would be older than us. It's so funny as well because a lot of people didn't actually know how old we were. They saw Overload video and was like, okay, cool. But never ever questioned that we were 14, 15. We did Glastonbury many, many years ago. And that was on the main stage. And I just remember people singing all our lyrics and singing all to the songs. And it's just weird because it's when you go to different places, like uh, Mike Hoopla is predominantly gay. I feel like Sugar Bay's music's very, it's, it's just got that uplifted type of way. But then when you go to Glastonbury, where it's a bit more serious, but fun. It's still fun, but everyone's a little bit more serious than, than, than the Mike Hooplas and stuff. You get scared. And I remember going on Glastonbury saying that and being very scared because... It was someone, I can't remember who it was, but there was like bottles of being thrown at them before we had um, before we had gone on. It was just, they were on before us, whoever it was. There was a rapper, I can't remember. And the people were throwing bottles. And I was like... <gasps> they were throwing bottles of pee at the, the person before you. At the person, yes. And then, um, and then when we came on, the crowd went wild. And I was like, it's bizarre. I feel like when we sing live, it's our best time. We had the best time ever. And I think that's the best potential that you see from us um, is singing live. And that's why we love singing live so much. I could I could literally talk to you for days. But <laughs> one of the key things we ask people in these interviews is about advice you would give yourself. Or in fact, what you wish you knew when you were 25. So in your mm-hmm. mid-20s, what, what, what advice would you give yourself now? I think for me personally, I feel like now I look back and I just think I would have smiled more. I would have embraced the moments. I would have uh, embraced the people I met around me and also the countries that we was able to travel. Crazy, like crazy countries that we've, I've been all over the world with Sugar Rays. This is, it's like, what more can I want? And I feel like appreciation has always been the key for me. Like I always appreciated, but never appreciated enough, you know? So now this time around, I'm like, we're here and you're going to see me smiling on everything. Actually saying that on our dance routines in Mighty Hooper, they were like, can you stop smiling? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stop smiling. Can I ask when you're in your mid twenties, uh, you've, you've left sh- the sugar babes, you, uh, you've become a mum. <laughs> You yeah. are doing your own solo stuff. At any yeah. point, did you think, I, I would like to go back, I'd like to join you guys again? Or is that not an option when you've gone and someone's replaced you? To be honest, it was kind of hard because obviously I got replaced and then and then the, the, the replacers got replaced and everyone yes. got replaced. And, and then in my head, it, I did think it was most probably over, like as in, as in me being again in the Sugar Babes. But our belief and our, our love for the sugar babes is so strong. Like, you know, I, okay, I, I know that we, I left and Keisha, obviously, Keisha got kicked out. And, but then it was like, we still worked our asses off for the sugar babes name. And we still worked as our asses off for sugar babes. You know, from the age of 10, 11, um, being in the studio till six in the morning, eating junk food all day, getting fat for no reason, and missing out on birthdays. We lived, we lived in Germany. I lived in Germany for quite a bit of time because... I remember having a schedule where we had a day off and I flew back into London for a couple of hours and flew back again. I literally lived in Munich and Frankfurt for like for about for most of like a year or so. People assume that the pop star lifestyle, the jet set lifestyle, it's all money and fun and games. It really isn't. If your family like I come from a big family, so I'm very family orientated. But I swear to God, I, I missed out on everything. I missed out on family functions. I missed out and that wasn't the problem. But I think the problem was is that it is a it's a thing when people think, oh yeah, you're living a glamorous life, and you know someone wants to try and make you feel like you know you're not doing enough yeah. to deserve that spot in a life, you know, in that life. And actually, 
not many people as I said you've got to be so strong-minded because you could lose yourself in any time and, and there's a lot of snakes out there and a lot of sharks so people are ready to bring you down at all times and you've got to be so level-headed and just know that you know I think with us right now we're grown women now so we can rely on each other you know back in the day we were like everyone wanted to talk to me separate talk to Keisha separate wanted to talk to Siobhan or Heidi separate and people always had their say in, in, in what they wanted but us Working at this age, we've got a couple of years until we're 40. <laughs> but we're still very yum, yummy. <laughs> <laughs> like right now, we just want to have fun and just go out there and make great music and and give what people are missing. I'm not saying that they're missing sugar babes, but there is a lot of, I feel like the music industry is so different from back in the day. And I'm not saying because of us, but there is not enough pop and there's not enough, you know, boy groups and girl groups anymore. And I think, you know, I think Smash It needs to come bring on a Smash It tour again where everyone's <laughs> on there. These are the stuff that we grew up on. And this is stuff that everyone enjoyed watching on the Saturday morning, you know, or Friday night going, who's your favourite? And who's your favourite artist? And actually be able to go there and see them without having to pay loads of money, you know, and, and appreciate music. And I think that's what we're missing right now. And so I'm, I'm, we're kind of happy to be back. No, we are happy to be back. Can I ask, I don't know how much you're allowed to talk about this or if you're you're not allowed or, or what the case is, but there was coverage about the copyright battle in your mid-twenties when you were you wanted the name of the Sugar Babes. So what right. what was that? So basically I had um I had changed management, obviously got new management. Uh funny in funny enough, my manager came up to me and was like, Oh, the Sugar Babes name isn't is is, is not isn't signed on it's not like logged onto the onto the main site and I was like what do you mean no one trademarked it I was like oh, that's a bit weird she has been going on for this many years not trademarked all right cool fine so I was like cool he was like well there's no harm in it we can just put your name forwards and you know anyway that turned into a catastrophe everyone started jumping on it because what happens is they obviously contact everyone and go well, some of those doing this now, do you want to go, you know, contest against it? And everyone contested against me. <laughs> um, so I won my battle where where I get, like, um, merchandise and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, and and I did think to myself, it was a bit dumb, someone not doing that. So everyone was doing the fighting for it. So now everyone's jumped on top of this. Yeah, and that's pretty much what happens. Um and then now we've won back our name, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think brought the end to the final Sugar Babes? I'm trying to think of how to describe the, the lineup, the last lineup, which was not. Hi, DJ, uh, yeah, Amel. Before you know, the line, the last lineup that didn't contain none of the original members. What do you think right. brought that to the, to an end? I'm going to be deadly honest with you, Heidi. I feel I feel Heidi's not an original, but she worked her ass off as much as anyone else did. Bearing in mind, Siobhan was with us from the early age, but Siobhan also left the group at quite a, quite an early time as well. So Heidi did replace her quite early on in the group. Sometimes it was hard to look. It was hard to watch sometimes. There was a lot of complications going on. I wasn't really allowed to be kind of, you know, I just remember being told I wasn't allowed to be underneath the same roof as the girls. If You know, it can't be a mutu and sugar babes underneath one roof. What, is, um, what does that mean? Um, I don't know. I was told I was making people uncomfortable. I don't know. Uh, so I basically couldn't perform anywhere that the sugar babes were. <laughs> well, that seems unfair. It was very unfair. I lost out on a lot of work. You know, it got to the point where everyone was like, well, do we want more tea or do we want sugar babes? And I just thought, Ugh. but then um, I feel like, you know, there was a lot of rumours and then there was a lot of things going on. Even to this day, I don't know what's true and what's not. I just remember just being told I couldn't. Um, but it was hard to watch. But I felt like, you know what, it's something I'm always going to be proud of. Like, this was our baby from 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 birth. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether people take over your group and you're no longer in it and, and they're being called. Because your success in the group and the name still lives on. And I think that's what the main key is. You know, Sugar Babes, whether it's us three, us, them three, another three, you know, the Sugar Babes name and the legacy still lives on. Let's go back to your your mid twenties. I think yeah. it was around that time you did Celebrity Big Brother. Yes, uh, and you walked out of that. I did. Maybe that's what people think that just she's fierce. She takes Maybe. no nonsense. Don't get in Maybe. her way. I mean, I had my reasons why I walked out because what they didn't show on the TV show is that I my face had actually I got an allergy, um, and my face blew up. 
basically and I was so upset with life and I was like what I'm on I'm on national tv cameras everywhere my face is blown up and that's why at one point you see me wearing a bandana around my face and um Crazy. yeah and 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 to be honest and that was the only reason why I kind of walked out and then Unfortunately, when my face blows up, it blows up. Sometimes it blows up to the point where I've got no lining underneath my eyes. We're, we're nearly out of time, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you don't mind, you can tell me to get yeah. lost if you want. I, I, I honestly won't be offended. Um, but we're talking about an industry where how you look is really important. Uh, rightly so or not, I don't know. It's not for me to say. Yeah. Oh, no, I'll talk about that. You've had some enhancements over the of years course. and changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think if you weren't in that industry, you would have you would have gone down that route? I think it, I think this industry is a very hard. It's a, it's very pressurizing in the way of to look perfect, to be perfect. To, you know, no one as a young girl wants to be not looked at. And I think I think in my eyes, it's weird because in my eyes, I was fat, I was ugly, I just didn't feel good. And on top of that, having baby blues with the girls didn't didn't it, it didn't make me feel good. Because I felt like I had this baby belly, even though I'd lost more weight than anything, I still felt crazy fat. Um, there's nothing wrong with enhancements, you know, whatever makes you happy. I believe women should go out there and feel happy in their best ways. Um, no one should ever feel like they've got, you know, authority to tell anybody how to how to look and how to feel. Yeah. Um, on a on a, on a recent tip for myself, for the last like two months, like month and a half, two months. I've been on a strict diet and I've literally been drinking. I I, I make green juices at like 4 a.m. in the morning. I make green juices, kale, everything, anything green, it goes, I drink it yeah. throughout the day. I drink black coffees, no sugars. I drink lots of waters. Where is the fun in that? You know what it is? It's, I, think it's, I think it's got to the point where I just, now I'm starting to feel like the happiest I've been for a very long time. And I... And that's within myself, to be honest, because I wake up in the morning and I just want to I just want to work or I just want to be positive or I want to find the next step of, you know, how to make money or how to, you know, maintain, you know, to be a, a better person. Um, and that, that obviously years ago, I wasn't trying to do that. that you know, I was trying to live life. But in, in your mid-20s, so, you can keep me right. Obviously, I can only refer to what I've seen in the papers and that. Mm-hmm. You had buttock implants and breast mm-hmm. implants. I saw you talking about it on Lorraine on a clip online. And yeah. the, and Lorraine said, oh, you didn't have them. I'm not trying to do her accent. She said, you didn't yeah. have that done at the same time. And you said, no, no, uh, there was a six-week gap in the middle. That's a lot of trauma to put your body through. Uh, and it, yeah. You know, you're in your um, mid-20s. You live the fast. You're living the fast life. In 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 in, the, in my mid twenties, I was living the fast lane. Literally, I was continuously going out, wanting to look prettier. What I didn't realize was the more alcohol I I took, was the more fat I was gonna get. <laughs> That's how it was. You know what? It took me a while to get used to what who I wanted to be as myself. Um, I got a lot of s- from the papers. Anything I do, even till this day on, I could sing and be the best person or I could do a charity. Someone always wants to kind of bring in all the fact that I've had, you know, um, not not saying you, but like when it comes to newspapers, they always want to bring in and make it such a negative post instead of it being positive. Um, you know, and that's, what, that's the only one thing that I always hated about people writing about me in the newspapers because I knew that this would be the only thing, like I could be helping the homeless out They'll go, oh, no, but Mutti with, I don't know, Mutti with the breast implants or Mutti with a bum, bum or Mutti with her lip injection. It's like you have to always mention something that's negative. People always want to kind of look at me and see what see what's going on with my body. And it's and it's, it's always on my, it's a conscious thing now. Like, I don't like wearing clothes too, too much. That must be a really strange experience because you know, to feel that way, People look at people, but to be so mm. concerned or feel nervous because of the feedback that you get and the the slightly over the top intense attention that you get, your body yeah. gets. Yeah, I'm more nervous about the way I look than the way I, the way I sing, and that's and that still goes on to this day. Like I get mad. I'm very very nervous because I just hate being judged. But then I did that to myself, and I put myself out there, and I did all those things. But to, do I regret it? No, but so I want people to understand that, you know, at that point of my life, I was a lot younger and, and you know, this was, it was the, it was the normal thing to do. Um, unfortunately, 
we don't all think the same. So I just, I know that, you know, I'm always going to get stick from this way or that way. I just have to kind of just get on with it. But my heart's with the music and everything I sing and express will always be through music. I mean, however anyone wants to look at me afterwards is, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I just have to kind of just keep my head up high and be like, we're back here to do music. We're here to have make people's lives, fulfill people's dreams and make people feel happy and, you know, and make ourselves feel happy. And if, if I, uh, to be honest, we all said already, if this is something that's not going to make us happy, we will not be doing it. Uh, we've talked through your 20s. We've talked through your, <laughs> your teens, a little bit of your 30s now. Um, yeah. Glass- oh my God. Glastonbury? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, it, it, by the time this comes out, you'll have done it again. And okay. how do you prepare for something like that? And how do you feel about it? I'm I'm just overly excited. Like I cannot wait for Glastonbury. Glastonbury, just to even be on the stage and and be a part of the whole the whole Glastonbury. It, to me, it it just shows you that we are good and we are worth what we're worth. Like you know, not everyone can do Glastonbury. Let's be honest. Glastonbury is a very hard crowd. I hope it goes as well as I think it does in my as it is in my head. <laughs> I can't wait. Do you have a, a ritual that you do beforehand? And, and don't say green juices and black coffee. Oh, wow. I have a little rum. We make a prayer together. To be honest, I, I feel like we're so nervous, like headless chickens. Um, at Hoopla, I was like, I lost my voice completely. So I was so upset. And then it, as soon as I got on stage, it came back with the adrenaline. And then when I got back off the stage, it just went again. So I know that I kind of was just more for, for this time around. So I, just, I was kind of more pacing up and down, just praying. <laughs> that was going to sound good. <laughs> we just kind of psych each other up and be like, yeah, we got this. We got this. We're good. As we come to an end, uh, I've really yeah. enjoyed talking to you. And you've, oh, thank you. I've kind of asked you already this, but I'm going to ask you again. Um, if you could whisper in your own ear in your mid-20s, which was a fairly... A busy time in your life, turbulent in some mm-hmm. ways, positive and exciting in others, but difficult. What would you say? What would you whisper in your own ear? Take time. Like I would have took time. I would have just, I would have given myself time. I think I was so hard on myself back then. Um, besides from like me trying to enjoy life and stuff, to myself, I was literally my worst enemy. Um, so I think I would have just said like, just be nice to yourself and take time and Maybe if I was nicer to myself, I would have been able to have seen clearer about things and, you know, lived, lived the lifestyle that maybe that I kind of do now, but in a, in a really more clear minded way. You know, having too much fun, maybe probably drunk most of the time. You know, I did what everyone else did, but unfortunately it was more in, in the public. So I think if I just took time out for myself and just went, you know what, slow your pace down and and enjoy life and enjoy what is, what's in front of you. Yeah, that would be me. That's exactly what I tell myself. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. And and again, I hope, you. good luck with Glastonbury. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You Lovely soon. meeting Bye. you. You too. Bye, Bye. This series was presented, produced and edited by myself, Vinnie Hurl. The editor was Paul McLean. The series was commissioned by Emma Dunseith. And thanks as well to support from Gareth Gallagher and Emma Arbuckle. Other episodes are available from these fine people. Surely you don't expect me to talk to you about that. Surely. Hi, this is Dame Kelly. Hi, I'm Kerry Katona. Hi, I'm Mark Feely from Westlife. Listen to my When I Was 25 on BBC BBC Sounds. Sounds. That's marvellous. If after listening to this episode, uh, you feel like you'd like some help or information, then please do go to the BBC Action Line website, bbc.co.uk slash action line. Thank you very much and bye-bye.